So good morning, uh, Marina. It's good to see you again. Uh, it's been some time since we've talked, and I understand you've been traveling. Uh, yeah, good morning, Greg. Nice to see you. I hope you had a great holiday season uh, and enjoyed a good meal as well. Yes. Uh, yes, I had been traveling. I'm actually right now in Spain, as you could see the flag uh, with a Spanish flag and the typical ox there. Uh, so I'm still here enjoying the beautiful, uh, the beautiful weather we have. We're 14 degrees plus with sun and uh, enjoying the great food. Um, I rediscover uh, being back in Europe. <laughs> great, great. Um, well, so we've we've been talking about different topics, and you've mentioned in a past podcast how different the food is from place to place in Romania, Spain, Canada. Uh, but we've also talked about different health conditions. I talk a lot about insulin resistance and and weight loss and metabolic syndrome. You've been discussing, or we've been discussing a little bit in the past on thyroid. And uh, at my uh, Christmas dinner at the table where I was sitting, uh, two or three of the women were suffering from various thyroid problems and were on medication for that. And, uh, uh, and so it's a, it's a pervasive challenge for women around the world or around the Western Europe and, and uh, America, I'm not sure, but maybe you could tell us a little bit about your story and uh, when did you first discover it? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thanks so much for bringing that out. Um, yeah, that's a health condition that I'm always uh, have that I always have to deal with since I was actually 16. And uh, in my case, it was genetic uh, because my dad is suffering from that, my sister as well, and myself. Um, and how I discovered was that um, my period was very regular and then my mom was always concerned and always being on top with the doctors and uh, take some blood tests for us. So one day she said, well, I think it's, it's good to just check because there are a lot of people out there who might suffer from these, but they have no clue because it's a disease that um, you don't have a lot of symptoms or you do, but you don't know how to recognize them because they're not very like a cold or when you have fever, right? So we went and um, indeed uh, I was diagnosed with uh, actually um, thyroid. And uh, what type of thyroid I discovered was through the symptoms I had, like very dry skin, always cold feet, um, I also tested not all, all, only my blood tests, but also I did some antibodies. And that's how I discovered that I have Hashimoto, which is apparently it's 90% of people, especially women, are suffering from this. 90% um, of the people with thyroid problems, it's exactly. the kind of Hashimoto, yeah. And what percentage exactly. of the population is, di is thyroid, you think? 5%, 10%, 1%? Maybe, I don't know, I would like, okay. I have no clue, but I would like to say maybe 10%. Um, okay. There's so many people out there and other friends that I had been discussing with, uh, with and they were telling me, oh, I feel like this, I'm always cold. My skin is very, I'm always like, I try to eat healthy, but I always, it's so easy for me to put weight. Um, so I said to them, hey, listen, you might want to check it. You know, it's very easy. You can just take a blood test and then you'll go from there. So again, they might know or not know, uh, but uh, it's out there and it's very present. Sometimes it can be developed due stress. Uh, most of them it's developed because of genetic factors. Um, and in my case was like this, this is how I discover. Um, and since then, since I was 16, I start controlling with a, with a pill that I'm taking every morning and since now, and I'm testing myself every six months. Uh, I always test myself in winter and summer because, um, due to when it's heat, uh, it's better for your, your, it seems that your thyroid works better. And then my dose, it's always decreased by my doctor. And when it's uh, a little bit cooler, um, then I always increase my doses. So I always test myself twice a year. So it's not the sunlight or vitamin D levels. It's more just the temperature. You know, it's temperature combined with vitamin D. And that's something that I will touch uh, upon later, how important vitamin D is, especially for people with thyroid. And um, it, I'm here when I, well, I used to live in Spain and I didn't have to take vitamin D because we had a lot of sun. But now back in Canada, uh, in Vancouver, where it rains a lot, I do take my vitamin D, not only in winter, but also in summer. And um, 
even if it's um, sunny uh, in a winter day, my doctor always says you have to take it because the sun that you receive during winter, it's not the same and it does not have the same effects or power as the sun you received in summer. Right. Now, you, so you've uh, taken some nutrients or supplements. Uh, how did you change your diet after you found out about this? Or is that relevant for thyroid? Yeah, I'm not taking any supplements. I'm not a, a fan of these, but I do take my medicine that my doctor always uh, advised me uh, that it's especially for thyroid uh, people who are out there. I'm sure they know, uh, know about it. But yes, I start uh, being more um, conscious about my diet because it's true. It's also true that when you're 14, 16, your diet changes, your hormones are up and down, you lose weight, you gain weight. Uh, but I realized that I also had the tendency to retain a lot of water, um, even if I don't eat salty and even if I drink plenty of water. Uh, back at that time, you know, you were in high school and all the people are like, oh, she's a little bit more chubbier and, you know, you want to fit in the, the society, right? right. Um, so I actually start not with my 16 because I wasn't kind of aware or mature at the time. But um, when I uh, went to, to faculty, to university, I actually start looking more for sweets. So I reduced my, my sweets because uh, I used to actually, believe it or not, I, now I don't like sweets, but I used to eat quite a bit sweets, uh, a lot of bread, um, eating at a late, later hours. So this is how I started. I started a little bit gentle, um, taking out these things, uh, drinking way more water, being more conscious about it. And up to now, I, I, yeah, that's, that's a good point. And up to now, it's true that I've been more conscious with sports as well. And now my diet completely changed. Um, I don't eat sweets in general, uh, unless it's dark chocolate, uh, but just one or two pieces per day and not even every day. I don't, I tend not to eat after 7 p.m., which here in Spain, it's very difficult because they eat at 10. But again, right. the food is so healthy and so good that you actually don't feel it. Uh, I tend to eat if I eat bread, but here, just here in Spain, I, I uh, um, take advantage of this good bread just in the morning. Um, and I tend not to eat carbs such as rice, pasta. The first thing is because I don't like it. Uh, and secondly, it's because I try for lunch and dinner not to have this with my, with my meals. And then I don't drink alcohol. Of course, I have from now and then a sip of wine or something, especially during holiday, but I won't go to a pub to have drink after drink, which yeah. makes sense because I realize that when you drink, I don't know about other people out there, but I tend to eat more. Um, yeah. So I kind of stay, want to stay away from drinking. <laughs> yeah, it's a challenge. You're uh, control over, uh, you know, eating or eating sweets. Yeah, here there were boxes of chocolate around i paid no attention to them until one night i had too many drinks and next thing i know i was a couple pieces of chocolate and they were awful i mean but anyway they were store-bought regular christmas chocolate kinds yeah. but anyway yeah so so your daily life on the thyroid does it impact your work i mean some people get really tired um lethargic i mean you just power through that or how does that yeah, I'm glad you actually asked that because um, <laughs> I remember that um, my doctor uh, was saying that uh, when you have hypothyroid like me, you tend to feel lazy, you are not very active in general, you're lethargic, but me, I'm the other way around. She actually said, oh, that's kind of weird because you're very active, you're always running around, you're not lacking any energy, but you have the other symptoms, of course. Um, so not in this way, but yes, it impacts me a bit in the social life. I have to say, especially here in Spain, because of course it's a holiday. It was the holiday season and, um, my sister and her boyfriend were like, oh, let's go for a Pucania, which is a small beer. Or let, and I always kind of felt like, you know, I don't want to, I mean, I want to go, but I don't want to have that. But then they don't understand or the concept here at the bar to go and just ask for a Schweppes or a plain water. They look like you weirdly. Yeah. And they always bring the small tapas and I try to not eat too much because, you know, I want to keep my, my balance because I know that unfortunately my metabolism is way slower than the other ones. That's another effect of the thyroid, the hy hypothyroid. And it, it, it had been a challenge, to be honest. Um, but it's also a balance, you know, we, we did a lot of um, 
sports here because the, the weather is great. We ran, we did hikes, we, we went for long walks. So, you know, you, you, you don't feel it so much. So it's a little bit of a balance, but of course it impacts me and it impacts me also back in Canada because sometimes my friends want to have drinks and I'm the weird one yeah. who's not drinking. So yes, I have to maintain a balance and I have to also maintain a balance between my diet and when I go out and make sure that what I eat at least it's the healthiest that it can be, especially back in North America. But, but so, if, you're, uh, if you're running a lot, I mean, you run regularly in Canada, aren't you burning off any of those excess calorie you say your metabolism's low but that would be your resting metabolic rate you still got to burn every calorie that you need to race up and down i don't know how long you run per day but that's yeah. a lot of calories you're burning you have to get yeah. those from somewhere yes of course and i do the only thing is that um i remember going to a naturopath and when uh, there's a test that you can actually test your metabolic rate um and mine was really slow especially during night so Yes, you do. But for example, just to put an example, um, if in the morning here in Spain, I would eat a toast with some ham and a coffee, um, I wouldn't maybe another person, even if it's not running, um, and I, I don't want to put any example, but another person who has a normal metabolism would eat this bread and everything, but don't have to, doesn't have to think, oh, I have to go for a run or something. But I do because I'm like, mm, you know. Um, also for me, sports is not... And I think I mentioned this in my podcast. It's actually a way of releasing stress. And it's yeah. something that I love. It's not that I'm doing it to lose weight. Um, but of course, I always have to be conscious. Okay, I had this. So maybe I'll do five more minutes of cardio or stuff like that. Yeah. Meanwhile, another person doesn't have to think about it. It's pretty challenging to suffer from this. And honestly, I hope nobody will suffer from this because right. you always have to watch the calories. And on a, one way, it's good because you think you have a healthier diet than a person who doesn't have to count every single day the calories. But on the other side, it's the stress of counting calories, which sometimes yeah. my doctor said that it can produce amenorrhea from the hypothalamus, and this makes you lose the period. Huh. So, um, but we, yeah. But we, now, in the world of low carb and keto, where they're talking about reducing your carbs and increasing healthy fat in your diet, they generally argue against counting calories. They say, eat till you're full. Um, and you, and the argument is without the carbs, you won't have this uh, famished feeling that people get, you know, a little while after eating uh, heavy carbs. Uh, but you're saying you're trying to, or maybe it's just being careful, but the counting calorie stuff, they're a little reluctant on that, but maybe it's different in your, in your of course, and everyone's different, so. Right. For me, it's... Um... I'm not a believer of the keto. I think that everybody should eat a bit of everything. That's the reason I'm always having my bread again, especially here in Spain in the morning. Like, I, oh, when I see a bread, I'm like, okay, I'll take that. I'll yeah. take the toast uh, in the morning. Um, so I'm trying and I do eat healthy fats because the olive oil here, the avocado, um, some nuts from time to time. Um, um, so I do eat fats. Um, but I think when I say counting calorie, I mean, I don't, um, I don't put on a paper, oh, today I had this, this, this. No, not at all. I'm not, I'm not stressing like this. But it's true that, for example, if I have in the morning, because uh, here they do their three meals, right? So if I have the three meals, um, then I have to think, oh, I won't have a snack of uh, chocolate, a dark chocolate. Meanwhile, in Canada, in my routine, it's two meals plus a snack. Um, so then I don't, I, 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 this I refer, but no, I'm not putting okay. on my, on my paper. Cause, um, that would be right. really crazy. <laughs> yeah. oh, and back to one thing you, you mentioned, which is, it seems to me a core important issue is how different our meta metabolisms are, our bodies are. So thyroid Hashimoto's people would say, well, these set conditions and one is the fatigue and you're saying that's not your case. So it's amazing how, a a prime, what you would think of description of this is not your challenge at all. You're dealing with different things, which is why everyone needs to find their own path to dealing with whatever uh, health issues or metabolic states they have. And, you know, the, the nutritionists, some of the nutritionists would say that, gosh, that, that your diet is part of dealing with the thyroid. And maybe it is in the sense that you're choosing certain foods and not others. I mean, can you, is there, the chance that you'll find some magic food six months from now that improves things, or is it always going to be the medication that is the key thing in, in providing treatment? 
<laughs> I wish, you know, it's, uh, it's good that you asked me because um, <clears throat> when I went to a naturopath, um, she was mentioning that um, we could actually on a long term um, get rid of that medicine uh, through some foods. And to be honest, um, we did that. But in my experience, I'm not saying that does not exist, but in my experience, it didn't improve. It actually went a bit worse. Uh, it was just an experience with one person. Um, yeah. Everybody has its own thing. But to be honest, um, yes, uh, I heard cases um, I did not experience personally, so I can't talk from my experience. But as far as my concern, I'm trying my best to eat as healthy as I think I I. I can right. um again it's also the challenging of the ingredients you find here in spain or in europe it's way different because i can literally feel the taste of the food and i'm sh I'm, i know that they're way healthier because of the ingredients when i'm looking on the boxes yeah. going back to north america would be a bit of challenging um for me again to adapt to that um the, you know I'm the, saying, all these I'm sorry to interrupt the, the Aldi stores and the Trader Joe's stores. I shop at Trader Joe's. They're both owned by the same German uh, giant food uh, company, but a lot, a lot of their food, maybe a lot of their food is international. You know, you buy the pasta and it's, it's made in France and it's a <clears throat> three cheese spinach pasta. And I guess it's frozen there and sent over. It's so I don't know what extent, how to measure what percentage of the food. I mean, the shrimp comes from Argentina, you know, so it's very international, but you know, the bread is obviously made locally. Yeah. I think it's also the process of transporting, right? Because here in Spain, for example, they have a lot of uh, seafood. It's everything local. Meanwhile, um, yes, they bring the shrimps from Argentina, but for them to transport that, it takes a while. It takes some a refrigerator and then therefore they might need to pump some things into the food so that, um, you know, it, it stays. The processing is interesting, but the, the counter argument that Joe Cologne mentions in the history of Trader Joe's is when you catch a fish and freeze it immediately, like within an hour after you catch it, the fresh fish is in the boat for six hours till they get back to shore. And then another eight hours, it's cooled, but not frozen. Right. So, right. and then it's sitting in the store you know, so right. hamburger meat that's quick frozen or fruit, you know, the frozen fruit is frozen right as it's picked and mm. tends to be more nutrient dense. Now, it's more nutrient dense, dense if you walk outside and pick it. But if it has to come from California, they generally say eat fruit in season. But um, yeah. the frozen stuff, you know, is it tends to be more nutrient dense, at least that's my understanding. It's worth right. researching. Right. And also this actually connects a bit with the thyroid and one of another, another actually symptom, it's inflammation and um, especially into the gut. And it's, uh, it's interesting because here, even if I add more, uh, like three days, uh, um, uh, three days, uh, three meals a day, um, I never, ever, ever felt bloated. And I had a lot of yogurt, a lot of cheese. Uh, it's true that milk, no, because I, I took the oat milk here as well, because I found it, but then nothing. And when I go back to, to North America, I know that instantly if I eat some yogurt or something, I will feel really bad. So inflammation, it's another thing that actually it's one of the symptoms of thyroid and it's related to your gut and how your microbe works in your stomach because your metabolism and digestion, it's a little bit slower then you tend to uh, be more affected by inflammation and yeah. it happens in, into these parts of the world, different parts of the world. It's interesting. Dairy is different in different parts. I've been eating, uh, drinking A2 milk, which is, uh, you know, the milk in Northern, the cows in Northern Europe versus Southern and the cows, different areas. And of course, yogurt is a challenge because they often stuff so much sugar in it. You have to find the plain yogurt, but yeah, so many challenges. Um, okay. So, uh, what did you learn as you, you know, as you experience these things, but also you talk to your uh, endocrinologist and you did research. What are some of the more uh, relevant things about this that you, that you learned? Yeah. So one of them, it's actually uh, yodine and vitamin D. Apparently I'm always, I love fish, but sometimes I'm just craving fish. I'm like, okay, that's not quite normal or not. So 
when I talked to my doctor, to my endocrinologist, she said, oh, yes, it's very normal for people who are suffering from thyroid because people who are suffering from this disease, they're actually uh, lacking a lot of vitamin D and iodine. Iodine you can find in nuts and vitamin D you can find in fish, mussels, oysters, uh, all those uh, seafood. So that's the reason you're actually craving because you're lacking those vitamins. Therefore, um, the diet she was always recommended for me, uh, not, not to lose weight for my thyroid, was full of uh, packed with fish and packed with sardines and packed with nuts, uh, small quantities, right? The plain nut, uh, not the cash or anything, like the walnut, uh, two per day. Um, two so that's two one walnuts of- per day? To two half of the walnuts per day. I mean, one nut, a whole walnut per day. Um, okay. I guess that, yeah, yeah. They're, I mean, I think of the walnut as a little teeny nut, but uh, uh, yeah, well, or maybe it's, it's a bigger, a bigger thing. Yeah, like the, the bigger thing. one. Yeah, gotcha, yeah, gotcha. yeah. Okay. Because because people who are suffering from this are lacking those nutrients. So that's right. one thing I learned. Um, and the second one was actually the vitamin D. Uh, it's true that people who are suffering from thyroid, um, especially uh, Hashimoto, are lacking a lot of vitamin D. Therefore, it's also very important to have the fish, the seafood. So I strongly recommend people who are out there. And if you don't have any allergy um, to, to that, um, go for it, especially muscles. And muscles are very good for iron, which is another symptom um, lacking iron for a woman, especially who are uh, yeah. suffering from thyroid. And then sardines, if you want a lot of vitamin D. Uh, and then, uh, the last I thing a, I learned, I took a can of sardines with me on my last trip. So that's great. That's I, yeah, great. A little teeny. Yeah, it was great. They're so good. And then another thing I learned was what I mentioned before with, with, uh, all those ma- medicine that if you have some problem with a thyroid, please don't try to look further, um, not just take the pills and think that if it's everything co- okay, it's actually okay, because it's not, it's a fake something, something that it's provoked fakely. So I recommend a woman to, to research more, to look for other doctors to also go to an endocrinologist. It's very, very important um, to, yeah. to do that because they approach on the other thing from another perspective and they see other things that you don't. And then the explanation that I said about the um, amenorrhea that you can provoke uh, from your hypothalamus because you don't eat the good diet uh, because you're lacking lots of carbs and you you train too much but like to an extent that you're a half marathon or you yeah. know like a, a heavy training then this might affect you and actually you can even if you don't suffering from thyroid due to those factors and stress you can actually um, provoke thyroid because okay. the hormones are very sensitive so you mentioned uh, seeing an endocrinologist or maybe a different doctor. One of the amazing things about the the podcasts and the videos now is that you can, you know, if, I mean, if you went to a new doctor, they might give you their 10 minute pitch on how they see, they'd look at you, but they'd also give you your general theory. Well, now you can go online and you hear, you know, OBGYNs, people dealing with thyroid, you hear them talk about it <clears throat> in depth and you can listen to a dozen people who are medical researchers, PhD doctors, people with huge experience. Uh, you told me you would listen to the uh, interview with the uh, uh, Jamie uh, uh, Seaman, I think, who's OBGYN. Yeah. And uh, I think the discussion was on thyroid, but Correct. tell me a little yeah. bit about that and we can link to it in the yeah, yeah. Uh, it was actually really great. I loved it. It's a uh, one hour and a half podcast, but I do recommend to all of you who are out there to actually take the time and listen. Um, she touches everything uh, related to thyroid. She explains about insulin resistance. Why do we have those problems? Why insulin resistance appears? Um, and it's not so medical. Uh, it's not such a medical or technical point of view. You can actually understand if you did your research and you know a little bit more about this uh, this matter. And one of the things she mentioned was uh, what I just uh, what I just said right now about the. Um, uh, women who are actually suffering from uh, irregular periods, they think that's related to a gynecologist, but then they don't test themselves uh, for thyroid. And actually, one of the reasons can be a thyroid, a thyroid that does not work properly. And then um, they go to the doctor, they take their pills, they think that everything is okay, but it's not because they don't solve the problem of the thyroid, of the hormones, they don't take the certain pills for the thyroid, especially. 
um, so that's something that uh, really caught my attention because it was something that I dealt with and um, I rely and I saw myself into that. And another thing really important that she's actually mentioning about the diet, about how you can um, adjust your hormones and actually on a long term get rid of the thyroid uh, through a really good diet. Um, they're not talking about so much about taking out meat or anything or extreme diets. Uh, but just having that uh, present in mind that the diet, good, good nutrients um, are helping you, that's something that you can actually achieve um, on a long term. So that's something that really caught my attention. I was really interested to see from their perspective, to see how they put um, and how do they, they explain. And that's the beauty of the, this podcast. They explain to you so that you can understand the whole process of it.